Greetings, ladies and gentlemen, and everyone in between. We are coming to you tonight live, straight from Theater for the New City. I'm Crystal Field. I am the executive director of Theater for the New City. And tonight, we present to you a live reading of a new play by David McDonald, directed by Melania Levitsky. And it is called Ella the Ungovernable. Wait in the water. Wait in the water, children. Wait in the water. God's gonna trouble the water. The year is 1933 the height of the Great Depression. A young black woman sits on a bus, gazing out the window at the rolling hills and farm fields of upstate New York. The bus is heading towards the New York Training School for Girls in Hudson, New York, two hours north of New York City. Where the heck are they taking us? I'm not sure. I've never seen so many trees. Where are all the people? Ella turns around to address the girl's question, and when she does that, the audience can see that she is handcuffed to the seat. I don't know. Stage right, bus station in Virginia. In, it's 1923. Ten years earlier, Ella's mother, Tempe Fitzgerald, gets on a bus with her toddler daughter, Ella. Uh, New York, you? You got a job up there? No, I don't. Me neither. Just figured I mean, things couldn't be any worse down here. Yeah, same for me. I mean, I make 10 cents an hour working um, for a sharecropper. That mm. is when I can get work. <laughs> <laughs> I know what you're saying. Yeah. Have you ever thought about uh, what might happen if, if if you can't find a job, if you can't find no place to live, you know, the idea scares me. I, I don't know. I can't let that happen. Stage left entering the grounds of the reform school. A bus pulls into the dark yard of the New York Training School for Girls, a Victorian era prison in Hudson, New York. You can hear the voices of the guard yelling everybody off the bus. A white male guard leads the girls to the forefront of the stage. 15-year-old Ella Fitzgerald looks utterly sluggish, depressed, resigned. She is led into a darkened jail cell and pushed onto the lower bunk. The lights go black. Stage right, Tempe's job hunt. Hello, sir. I'm, I'm looking for work. I can cook, so clean. Fold, wash dishes, everything. I, I need somebody to fold laundry part-time. Can you start right away? I need someone to do the dishes in the morning and in the evening. It'll be 20 cents an hour. Flash forward in time to stage left, Ella's prison cell. An alarm goes off. Ella's new cellmate, Alice, leans over her. Hello there. Hello. Do you know where you are? No. Uh, uh, You're sorry. at the New York Training School for Girls in Hudson, New York. I'm Alice. I'm your cellmate. Hello. What's your name? Uh, Ella. Ella Fitzgerald. Where are you from? Uh, well, Virginia by way of Yonkers, by way of Harlem. You? Georgia by way of Brooklyn. You ever been in a place like this before? No. Would you care to hear any advice? Sure. Well, 
let me tell you some things that you probably need to know so you aren't caught off guard. I won't have much time to tell you this. The guards will come any second. So please listen. Okay. Firstly, don't make eye contact with anyone. The guards, your fellow inmates, anyone. It's the law of the jungle here. If you make eye contact with anyone, it's an excuse to fight. You ever hear the expression, what are you looking at? Or you looking at me? Those are the cliches used to start fights here. I literally hear those words used every day. Got me? Yes. Just mind your own business and keep yourself and you'll probably be okay. Probably, but not always. Cause some people will just want to fight and you probably won't be able to avoid it. Okay. If somebody does want to start a fight with you, it's better idea not to back down. If you back down, they'll take it as weakness and that'll give everyone an excuse to bully you. Is there anyone here that I can trust? That's a good question. I guess the answer is nobody. You can't trust the guards. Look at them the wrong way and they'll take any excuse to hit you with their fists or their billy clubs. Just be meek and quiet and pray that they don't notice you. Superintendent is a white lady and she seems nice, but if you go to her, you will be immediately branded a snitch. So take my advice and just don't do it. How about the girls? I guess I would say don't trust any of the girls until you can be absolutely sure. Many of the girls here come from terrible backgrounds, abandoned or abused. If somebody is nice to you, it's often for a reason. They want something from you. Everything here is always about favors. You do something nice to me and I owe you. So make sure not to accept any favors unless you know you can return them. The last thing you wanna do is start here owing a lot of favors. You'll never know what people will ask you to do when they expect you to return their favors. This all sounds very depressing. <laughs> Wish I could say it wasn't, but it is. And if you follow my advice, you might be able to make it out of here in one piece. But uh, sh 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 when the guards come, always be ready. Never look at them. Don't ever give them a reason to notice you. So are you ready? Yes. That's good because here they come. Follow me, do what I do. But sh sh stop talking, get ready. Alice scurries to the sliding gate of the cell and stands there as if at attention. Ella follows suit and stands behind Alice. Another jarring whistle blows and then a loud buzzer. We hear the sound of footsteps and a billy club sliding across metal bars. A sallow faced guard appears and opens up the gate, barely looking at the two girls. Alice looks intently at Ella's face and puts her fingers up to her mouth as if to say, Keep your mouth shut. They walk out of the cell together. Flashback in time. To stage right, a dingy tenement apartment. Tempe and young Ella are on the search for an apartment in Yonkers. A solitary light bulb barely illuminates the darkness of a one-room tenement apartment. There is a bed and a table, but nothing else. It's 20 a month, rent's gotta be paid the first of every month, no excuses. If you're late, you're out. There is a sink over there and an outhouse in the back. Do not use the sink as your toilet. What do you want it? I ain't got all day. Yes, sir, I'll, I'll take it. Back to the jail, the prison mess hall, daytime. Ella sits at a long table next to Alice and several other girls. A bowl of porridge in front of her, barely alert while her fellow inmates devour their food. The female warden of the prison stands up and starts giving a welcome speech. Hello, I see we have a bunch of new girls here this morning. Welcome to the New York State Training School for Girls. This is not a prison per se, but neither is it your home. We expect a certain kind of behavior from you, Good behavior will be noted and rewarded. Bad behavior will be punished. Are we all clear on that? Are we all clear on that, ladies? Yes, yes ma'am. Ma good. Now, we have various training programs set up to reward you for good behavior, like a laundry for cleaning clothes or a hair salon, a gardening program, and a program that can train you to be domestic servants. You can choose which program or programs you sign up for, depending on availability. Is everyone clear with that? Yes, yes ma'am. Ma yourselves to yourselves and mind your own business and prove this over time 
we have an honors program that might enable you to periodically leave the grounds with a group chaperone. But that's only for girls with unblemished records. Are we clear on that? Yes, yes ma'am. Ma Let's see. Is there anything I forgot? The choir. Oh, <laughs> yes. We have a choir that meets at the church directly in front of the gate once a week. But again, that is only for girls with good records. Are we all clear? Yes, ma'am. Well, I hope you make good use of your time here and feel free to come to me if you're having any problems. End of scene. Backflash to Yonkers, stage right, a restaurant in Yonkers lunchtime. Tempe is working at the counter of a luncheonette when a tall and handsome man wearing a chauffeur's uniform walks through the swinging door and addresses Tempe. Well, hello, beautiful lady. You don't happen to have coffee to go, do you? Uh, yes, we do, sir. I'll, I'll get it for you right away. No, no, no. Take your time, dear. Tempe goes backstage to fetch the coffee. Joseph, in his fine chauffeur's uniform, turns around towards the audience and looks around the room as if though the character himself is on the stage and loves the adulation. He looks confidently around the restaurant, takes out his hand mirror, takes off his hat, and primps his hair in the mirror. He clearly is a rather vain person. Would you like milk or cream with that? Oh, cream, please. And sugar? Yes, yes, two sugars. Tempe Would you like anything else with that, sir? Yeah, um, maybe that donut there. Tempe grabs him a donut. Is that it? Yes. Okay, that'll be 99 cents. Joseph hands her a dollar. Out of a dollar. Say, I've, uh, I've never seen you here before. You've been working here long? Uh, well, if you buy something else, Maybe I'll have a chance to chit chat with you. What? All right. Stage left, outdoor recreation area, training school. It's daytime. Ella is sitting forlornly with Alice on an outdoor bleacher overlooking the dirt playing field. So, how are you feeling? Okay, so you're not feeling great. Who would here? I remember my first week here, I thought I had died and gone to hell. I kept thinking to myself, what have I done to deserve this? Did I really do something this bad? You feel that way too? It's okay, it's understandable. Back when I got here, you know, I didn't have anybody to talk to, nobody to show me the ropes, nobody to tell me what to do or not to do. I wasn't here but five minutes and some girl tried to start with me. Yeah, she tried to start with me. And you know what I did? Well. <laughs> Let's just say she never tried to do nothing again. Well, you think that's funny? Hmm? No, no, I, I no. That's, that's okay. No, it's okay. Everyone thinks I'm easy pickings on just because my size. But don't be deceived. I'm tough. And nobody want to mess with me. I'm sure you're tough. What? I, I said, I'm, I'm sure you're tough. You really mean that? You're not just well, saying that. Well, I certainly wouldn't mess with you. Really? Really? Well, I'm not that bad. Well, don't nobody know that anyway. Thank you. A pause while she looks Ella up and down admiringly. Then... You're nice. No, I mean, you're very nice. Uh, thank you. Where'd you say you're from again? Virginia. Mm, yes, maybe that's why. That's why what? That's why I think you're so nice. You're a lady, a, a gentlewoman. You're dignified. <laughs> oh my gosh, stop. <laughs> but that might make it worse for you here. Be dignified and all. Oh dear, I hope not. Well, is there anyone here that I can trust? Anyone at all? Yeah, well, you can trust me. I need you here just as much as you need me. We're really all we've got, and you can count on that. Thank you, and you can count on me. If it's okay for me saying this, 
I sort of knew that the moment I met you. I am very grateful that you're here, even though that's pretty selfish of me to say. The lights on the stage go black. Flashback. Stage right, the dingy apartment. It's nighttime. It's moving in day for Tempe's new boyfriend. Tempe is preparing the dining table for dinner. Joseph sits down at the table and lights a cigarette, looking lasciviously at Ella, not her mother. Tempe doesn't seem to notice. They let me take a chicken and some fixings from the restaurant in honor of our new apartment. I thought that was very nice of them. Yeah, and I, I brought a bottle of wine to celebrate as well. <laughs> Joseph, you know I don't like drinking, especially around Ella. Ella, you don't mind if I have a glass or two, do you? To celebrate our new apartment together. Ella is Tempe. disgusted by the entire scene to know how to respond. Tempe. Ella and I have a, an understanding, don't we, Ella? I watch your back, you watch mine. Me? I think we're going to be very happy here, just like little roosters. <laughs> Lights fade out to signify the lapse of time. It's bedtime. In the darkness in the tiny apartment, we can hear the sound of Joseph trying to have sex with Tempe. We can hear ah. Tempe resisting. No, not with the girl around. Come on, we're, we're, we're just, come on. We're, we're just gonna have to, to, to get used to this. We're on top of ourselves here in this apartment. Please, no. The scene ends in the darkness to the sound of bed springs creaking. Stage left, outdoor recreation area, back to the prison. Ella and Alice are sitting on a bench at the outdoor recreation area. When two girls, Althea and Dorothy, come sit down with them. Ella, this is Althea and this is Dorothy. Nice to meet you. Pleasure to make your acquaintance. Man, the girl has got manners. You asked me before who you can trust. Well, you can trust these two. They're both nice girls. Ella just got here and I've been giving her some pointers as to who is okay here and who to avoid. <laughs> Well, that will be half of them or more. And that would eliminate you immediately, Althea. <laughs> You're so funny, Dor Dorothy. I forgot to laugh. So Althea, who would you recommend that Ella stays away from? I'll tell you, but we can't be seen to be looking at these people. You understand? Yes. And I'm serious. If you got to look, do it out the corner of your eye. Okay. 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 All right. See that big black girl over there with the white elastics in her hair? Stay as far away from her as you can. She's nuts and extremely violent. Rumor has it she was raped repeatedly by her father and her father's friends. And I've seen her beat the hell out of some girls here. So don't let her notice you, whatever you do, okay? Okay. Okay. And see that one across the field there with that orange bandana in her hair? Don't ever loan her, loan her anything. She will ask you repeatedly because you will never get it back or she'll even accuse you of stealing from her, which is even crazier. Okay. But the girls are nothing compared to the guards. Most of the guards are fine, but a few of them, well, like I said, you don't want them to catch you alone anywhere. There are three you have to watch out for in particular. There's this one called Paul Eddie. He's across the yard there with the one with the red hair. Doesn't seem to have any emotions, a brute. Will think nothing twice of braining you. There's another one right there, Vasily. He's not here right now, but he's uh, beating a bunch of girls. But the worst person, the most dangerous person, especially when he's drunk, is that guard over there. Oh, Boyle. If he doesn't try to rape you, then he'll try to beat you up or both. Never gets reported. <laughs> he gets away with whatever he wants. His cousin is the mayor of Hudson. Ella's gaze falls on O'Boyle, who is across the prison yard. He looks right back at her as if he can feel it. Ella's eyes drop down, but not before a brief moment of eye contact. Don't let him see you looking at him. I told you. Oh, dear. Don't let it happen again, okay? Otherwise, it's trouble for you. Okay. Ella, you ever been to Hudson, this town that surrounds us here? Uh, no. Well, Hudson was founded by sailors. It was the center of the whaling industry in America in the late 1700s. With ships, you get bars, churches, jails, and whorehouses. 
many of them have been in Hudson here ever since then. And I didn't know that. Neither did I. Well, it's relevant, so listen to what I'm telling you. Okay. <laughs> All these years later, the town's economy still runs on two things the jails and the whorehouses. Half of those guards here moonlight at the whorehouses and vice versa. They go from their jobs here during the day to work as bouncers at the whorehouses at night. They see some awful shit, people buying and selling their bodies. And when they're not seeing that, they're having to bust heads of the jerks trying to get away with shit at the whorehouses. Are y'all listening? Yes. Well, everybody in town gets a piece of the action. So jails and whorehouses become the family business for many people in the town, often both. A lot of these people here, their families have been working in the jails and the whorehouses for generations, even O'Boyle. When he comes in at night, drunk, he's been working security all day on Diamond Street. Like I said, O'Boyle's cousin is the mayor of Hudson and also the jailer at another jail in town. Do you know what our superintendent does? She's the town treasurer. The jails are all cash cows. So are the whore whorehouses. You starting to see a point? It's just business. Everyone is in cahoots with each other. Everyone commutes from one business to another. Somebody gotta, somebody's gotta keep the girls in line here, right? It's the same person who's protecting the girls on the other side of town at night. And hell, it's not even personal. They wouldn't look at me twice if I walked out here on my last day at this institution and got a job hooking at my damn Isabel's. <laughs> Cause that's what ha half the girls do here when they leave and particularly the black girls. How else can you pay your way out of town? <laughs> so the bottom line is, Life doesn't mean all that much in Hudson, New York. What matters is the bottom line. And they're all connected. So maybe if we're all good girls, there may be a job waiting for you on Diamond Street when you get out of here. That's a pretty bleak worldview, Althea. I'm just being real. Hell, I might have to do it myself. So whatever I say, just see that you aren't noticed. Being noticed is a ticket to hell. The scene ends with Ella and Alice feeling very troubled. Flashback to the dingy apartment, nighttime. Ella lies on her bed at the back of the stage doing her homework. Joseph stands at the forefront of the stage with a beer bottle in his hand. He's whistling and catcalling girls out on the street. Hey, hey there, sweetheart. How are you doing today? Hey. Huh? <laughs> I'm okay, what are you up to? Oh yeah, 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 just uh, enjoying this lovely Lovely spring, end of winter, right? We've all been in hibernation. You know what I mean. <laughs> yeah, I know what you mean. You, uh, you're new in town? I've never seen you around here before. No, nah, I live right over on 34th. Hey, hey, you want a beer? You want to sit on the stoop with me, have a beer? Hey, hey Ella, Ella, get me a beer huh? from the icebox, please. I'm trying to do my homework. Hey, it's just a little request, right? If you want a beer, get it yourself. Yo, what are you busting my chops, girl? Don't I do things for you all the time? Like what? Drink? Sit around and drink and smoke and give orders? If you want to flirt with a girl out on the street, don't expect me to help you. And mom doesn't want you drinking anyway. It's just a couple of beers or two. And besides, your mother and I have an agreement. I stay home and babysit while she's at work and I get to have a few beers. I've never heard anything about an agreement. Well, what your mother and I decide together is none of your business. And watch your back talk. Are you going to help me or what? I'll just be with you in a second, honey. Ella gets up and fetches Joseph a bear. Thank you. Ella turns her back to him and returns to her homework. The next scene. Ella and Tempe are taking a walk through a park. Mama, what was father like? <laughs> what was father like? Well, he was a fine, fine man. Do you ever miss him? <laughs> Do I ever miss him? Well, aren't you the one with the questions this morning, Pooh Bear? Yes, of course, I missed him. Do you? Very much. But Joseph loves you too, dear, very much. You do know that, don't you? Well, sure, I guess. It's very difficult when a child grows up without a father. You know, I lost my mother too when I was only about your age. It took me a long, long time to get over it. 
Well, when I get blue sometimes, I like to sing a song that my mother and I used to sing together before she passed. Have I ever sung it to you? No, I don't think so. <laughs> really? That's funny. I was sure we had. It sort of goes like this. A tasket, a tasket, a green and yellow basket, I bought a basket for my mama on the way I dropped it. You want to sing along with me, Pooh Bear? Uh, okay, I'll try. <laughs> okay. A tasket, a tasket, a green and yellow basket. I bought a basket for my mommy on the way I dropped it. Perfect. Now let's try the rest. I dropped it, I dropped it. Yes, on the way I dropped it. A little girly picked it up and took it to the market. She was checking on down the avenue without a single thing to do. She went peck, peck, pecking all around when she spied it on the ground. A tisket, a tasket. She, she took, took my yellow, yellow basket. basket. And if she, she doesn't, doesn't bring it back, I think that, think that I, I will die. die. Was it red? No, 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 no. Was it brown? No, 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 no. <laughs> no, 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 no. Just a little yellow basket. <laughs> Oh, Mom, I love you so much. I love you too, Pooh Bear. End of scene. Dining hall. Ella and Alice sit amongst a group of fellow inmates at a long mess hall table. There's a loud conversation going on behind Ella. You know, so I said to the bitch, Leave me the fuck alone, bitch, or I'm kicking your ass, and I ain't lying. Tell you. You know what she said to me? Do you know what she said to me? No, what? She said, go ahead, cunt. Basically just dared me to slap her in the face, and you know what I did? What? I, excuse me, is my conversation that interesting to you? Ella keeps eating, trying not to pay attention. I know you can hear me, bitch. No use in pretending you ain't. I honestly was was not listening to you. I honestly was not listening to you. Like hell you weren't. Alice has been watching the interaction, and she takes Ella's arm and tries to draw her into the conversation. I'm talking to you, bitch. Alice and Ella continue to try to talk with each other. Do you not hear me talking to you, bitch? Don't try to ignore me. I honestly have no interest in your conversation whatsoever. The girl hasn't had enough. She stands up from her chair and gets behind Ella and Alice. She then pokes Ella hard in the back. Then something happens that surprises everyone. Ella moves forward on the girl and gives her a powerful shove, saying, Don't you ever touch me again. Ella's shove causes the girl to fall backwards on the floor. A piercing whistle breaks out. Sit down, both of you. Get back in your seats. Stage lights go down. The next scene, Ella and Alice are back in their cell. Alice is on the top bunk. Ella is down below. Wow, that was pretty awesome. What was? Uh, that? <laughs> her? I, I don't care about her. She has nothing to do with me. I just want to do my time here and get out of here. Uh, well, yeah, but... You know. That was still pretty awesome. Well, I don't care. I just, I just want to be left alone. You know, when we were talking about, you know, me being a badass earlier, 
that that was truly badass. I couldn't have done that. I've learned a long time ago that you can never allow yourself to be abused because like you said, if abusers learn that they can get away with it the first step, then they take another and then another. But if you don't mind me asking, does this come from experience as well? Soon after we arrived in Yonkers, my mother met this man, Joseph. I don't know what she saw in him. Well, yes, he was a very he was very good looking, but he was a good for nothing. My mother was used to work all the time. Joseph only worked when he felt like it. She would be out all day and he would be sitting at home and or waiting on the stoop, always looking for around, looking around for what he could get. And your mother didn't see what was wrong with him? I don't think so. Or I don't think she wanted to. She, she was just was desperate to have some company, any company. Then one day it was over, just like that. My mother was killed in a hit and run crossing the street. Oh God, I'm so sorry. It's all right, don't worry. So anyway, the problem was that my mother had never kept up with any of my family in Virginia. So I couldn't go back to them. So I was stuck living with Joseph. And he went from giving me too little attention to giving me too much attention, if you know what I mean. Oh, Ella, I'm so lonely. I miss your mother so much. Leave me alone, please. Oh, like, uh, could you just hug me? I just need a hug so bad. Don't touch me. Oh, shit. Oh, so then what ended up happening? Well, one night I was lying in bed and he came home after a night of drinking and he tried to well, you know, he got on the bed on top of me and, and well, I was fed up. So I hit him in the head with an iron. An iron? <laughs> Just like in the cartoons. Don't make me laugh. It is totally not funny. No, but it is funny. <laughs> okay, well, maybe it is a little funny. <laughs> but and I certainly didn't want to be around the next day for his hangover and broken head. So I finally decided to open up to my social worker and tell her exactly what had happened. Oh my gosh, and then what happened? Well, they immediately got me out of there. <laughs> they put me in a home with a family in Yonkers for a while and contacted an aunt that I didn't know I even had in Harlem to see if I could live with her for a while. So there's a happy ending to the story after all? Uh, I wish I could say that. <laughs> Stage right, a brownstone in Harlem. Two women are standing in front of a house, Ella's aunt Edna, and a social worker. So you're saying that if I take this young girl on, I'll get an extra $5 a week in housing allowance and another 10 in food? That's right. And you can start right now by signing on the dotted line. <laughs> what? And I don't have to buy anything extra or to cook. I hate to cook. Well, she'll need chores to do around the house, just like everyone who knows. <laughs> Maybe she likes cooking. Some people do. <laughs> hey, were you close to her mother, Tempe? Nah, I ain't seen her in years. I haven't seen Ella since she was a baby. Oh, this is an emergency situation. Ella would be homeless if not for you. It's a beneficial thing for both of you. The lights go dark a brownstone in Harlem. Ella and her social worker are standing in front of Aunt Edna's brownstone. They have to ring the doorbell once, then twice, before the aunt finally opens the door, smoking a cigarette. Is this the one? <laughs> so you must be Ella. Come on up, precious. Oh, it's been years since I seen you. How is my baby doing? Ella's completely uncomfortable. The aunt walks Ella and the social worker into the house. The house is very dark and dusty, heavy curtains shielding out the light from outside. They go into the front parlor where furniture and bottles are strewn everywhere. You know, sorry it's such a mess in here, but I got two jobs and barely any time to cook or clean. Hey, Ella, I could use some help around the house. Are you okay with that? 
where we should be sleeping? Oh, there's a very nice bedroom behind the kitchen here. Aunt Edna escorts the two women into the living room. She seems a bit wobbly, as she has already been drinking. She opens the door up to what is to be Ella's room. Well, we got indoor plumbing here, bathrooms on both floors. Well, it seems like a big step up for you <laughs> where, from where you were, Ella. H how do you feel about it? Okay, I suppose. Well, I'm just going to go outside and talk about a few things with your aunt, if that's okay. Why don't you make yourself at home here for the moment? Ella goes to into her room. Well, she doesn't seem like much of a talker, that one. Do I need to worry about attitude problems? Ella's just had a lot to deal with over the last year or so. Death of her mother, some issues at home. She is a very strong girl. She'll be okay. Well, I hope so, because her mama was a lot to deal with, and I hope she's not just a chip off the old block, because that would not be good. The social worker leaves. Later that evening, Aunt Etta reveals her true self to Ella. I will need you to do the laundry every week, do the cooking, clean up this house. <laughs> the lights fade out on Aunt Etta, nodding, nodding while smoking at the dinner table. There is noticeably no food on the plates. I also very quickly realized that food on the dinner table for breakfast, lunch, or dinner was not expected. Her priorities were number one, alcohol, and number two, cigarettes. I don't know if she drank before or during work, but I do know that's all she did the minute she got home. So all the extra money she was making wasn't going to me, that's correct. The irony was that it still felt a hundred times safer than living with Joseph. I got pretty good at going into dumpsters behind stores, finding enough to sustain myself. Aunt Edna didn't seem to feel the need to eat and she certainly didn't seem to feel the need to feed me. Suddenly a jail guard appears at the back of the stage. It's jail, you want it in the office. Now? Now. The scene changes. Dr. J.L. Marino's office. Ella enters stage left and approaches Dr. J.L. Marino's desk. Marino rises to shake her hand. Hi, Ella. My name is Dr. Marino. I am a psychologist here at the training school. I'm here to help you with your life here. Oh, uh, well, hi. How have things been going for you? You feeling okay? Everything all right? Uh, yes, uh, uh, okay. Huh. Yeah, I've been looking over your file here, and it says that you're originally from Virginia, then you came up north with your mother to Yonkers, then she died, passed away, and that you ended up with your stepfather and then your aunt? Yes, sir. Well, it seems like you've had a lot of hard things to deal with so far in your young life. Uh, well, I don't know, sir. It, it seems like it's no harder than most. Marino Ella. appears at her record, nods his head. Sensing she isn't being fully forthright with him, he decides to take a slightly different tactic. Ella, you don't know me, so I can't expect you to trust me yet. All I want to tell you is that I'm here to try and help problem solve for you. If you're having a problem here, I'm the person you'll need to talk to to help you to resolve that problem. Understood? Yes. Well, now, Ella, it says here that there was uh, some trouble in the dining hall yesterday morning with a girl named Lakeisha Morris. Can you tell me about that? I I'm sorry. I'm not too sure who that is. It was the girl you got into a conflict with in the cafeteria yesterday. Uh, oh, you mean, you mean the girl with the white elastics in her hair? Uh, yes, I guess so. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I didn't know what her name was. Oh, I see. Can you tell me about the incident, please? Well, I was doing everything in my power to avoid it. She was, 
insisting that I was listening in on her conversation, which I wasn't, and I had no interest in her conversation whatsoever. And? And then she started calling me names. Like? Is it okay if I say them? <laughs> sure. Uh, okay. Uh, like the B word and the C, then the C word. And, and, and then she got up from her seat and started poking me in the back and she was trying to bully me. And I've been bullied before. And I've learned that when you let a bully get away with one thing, it opens the door for more bullying. And? So I stood up face to face with her and I told her never to touch me again. And I pushed her as hard as I could. Why didn't you just motion for a guard to come and help you? Ella knows that there is no way she can possibly truthfully answer the question. So she fibs. I realized in retrospect that that's probably what I should have done. Well, can I ask you, the next time something like that happens to you, can you come to me? Sure. Reading your file, I know what happened with you regarding your mother and stepfather, and then you ended up with your aunt in Harlem. Well, may I ask, what ended up happening there? Your aunt describes you as being ungovernable which I find sort of difficult to believe now that I've talked to you. Well, my aunt wasn't feeding me. Flashback to Harlem Brownstone, the home of Aunt Edna. Ella walks through the front door of the Brownstone. Is that you, Ella? Ella knows something's up, something not good. She comes inside and sees Aunt Edna drunk at the back table. <laughs> Where you been, girl? Oh, just out getting a bite to eat. Oh, a bite to eat? Where? Just up the street at the diner. Are you saying I ain't feeding you? Uh, no. Have, have you seen the condition of this house? It's filthy. Okay, I'll, I'll get to it. When? Tomorrow? The next day? No, I'll do it now. See that you do. I mean, unless you want to be homeless again, and I know you wouldn't want that now, would you? So how did you go from living with an aunt to working for a house of... Stage right. A street in Harlem. Ella's going through garbage looking for food. A gorgeous, somewhat tough-looking woman with bright red lipstick observes her from behind. She scares the hell out of Ella, who barely stutters a reply. I, uh, um, well, I, I was... Well, um... Um, 14. Can I buy you lunch? I hate to see a kid your age go hungry. Um, sure. Hold on there, kid. <laughs> no they one's going to take it from you. They walk to a table towards the back of the stage right. There is a hamburger sitting on a plate. Ella devours it. Hold on there, kid. <laughs> no one's gonna take it from you. Oh, I, I haven't eaten in two days. Don't make yourself sick. I can give you some money to buy yourself some food. Oh, why are you buying me lunch? I guess you could say I've been there, girl. Done some dumpster diving myself when I first come to town. It wasn't pretty. What do you do now? <laughs> you don't want to know. Yes, I do want to know. Kid, what's your name, by the way? Ella. Well, Ella, I'm what's known in some quarters as a fancy lady. Get my drift? No. Well, men pay me for their services. Like a maid? No, not like a maid. So, are you, are you like a, 
Like a prostitute? Jesus Christ, kid. Why don't you just blurt it out? Marie notices a woman at the next table staring at them. Yes, I'm a hooker. What are you looking at? So kid, what's your story? Why you don't have any food to eat? Well, my mother died when I, and I was left with my stepfather and he was touching me. So they put me in a place with my aunt here in Harlem. And why hasn't your aunt been feeding you? Um, she drinks most of the time. Oh, that's terrible. So basically you have no one keep an eye on you? No. You know, I was sort of in the same situation when I was 15. I was on my own and then I met this lady. Her name was Miss Mills. She took me under her wing, made sure I was always being taken care of. Yes. But it's unconventional work. Certainly not something for everybody. You mean? No, 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 no. <sighs> not prostitution. I would never ask you to do that, nor would she. Aside from being too young, you don't look the type. Well, so what would it entail? Basically just being a lookout. You would stand on a street corner or even sit in a cafe and keep an eye out for the cops. We have a system of lookouts, some further away, some closer, and they exchange a series of signals to make sure that the house isn't taken by surprise. That's it? You swear that's it? I swear. And I would be keeping my eye on you as well. No one would hassle you. Yeah, I think I can do that. The lights dim on the right side of the stage, and we go back to Dr. Morano's office. So that's what happened. Yes, basically, that's what happened. And they never asked you to um, uh, oh, participate no. in their profession? No, uh, never. I, I kept going to school every day. It, it was like an evening job from six to nine. The older kids got to handle the, oh, the later hours. Uh, and thus the grades. You kept your grade point average up. Yes. And how did you end up being sent up here? Well, one day I, I was sitting at the window seat of the luncheonette, like I always did. And maybe I was concentrating too much on my homework because I missed a whole bunch of police coming down the street and raiding the place. It was really my fault and this policeman approaches me and asks me what I'm doing there and I couldn't think of a story fast enough and before I knew it I was being led away in handcuffs and well, you know, I was sent here. Did your aunt do anything to help? Did she try to keep you or anything? No, not really. That's when in court she said I was ungovernable. This is all very sad. No, I have to say, I'm, I'm sad for you. Is there anything I can do for you here? It says something in here about you being in the choir at your school. Do you like to sing? Yes, very much. <laughs> well, we have a choir here, a very good choir. Would you like to participate in that? I, but I thought that was only for a, a good behavior, an award for good behavior. Well, I think, judging from what you have just told me, that uh, a lot of what you've been through hasn't been your fault. You've been a victim of circumstances. Would you like to try? Well, sure. Well, you would have to audition. Are you okay with that? Yes. Okay. I will contact the choir master, Mr. Ellison. He's a volunteer from town. In the meantime, will you keep me informed if you are having any problems here? Yes. Yes. Thank you. Ella gets up to leave. The stage lights go down, the end of the scene. The prison cell, it's nighttime. Alice and Ella both lie on their backs. Alice on the upper bunk, Ella on the lower. Who was your meeting with today? It was with the prison psychologist. And 
I thought he thought something was wrong with me too, but it was not what I was expected. Well, uh, well, first I thought I was going to be in trouble. Yeah. Because of what happened at the mess hall this morning. And then he asked me to tell my side of the story. And then to my surprise, he believed me. He believed you. That's good. Yeah, right. He started asking me questions about my, my mother and, and my stepfather and, and what happened to me in Harlem. And did you tell him the truth? Yes, I did. That was... I know, either brave or crazy. And how did he take it? I, I, well, that was the other weird part. It made him seem to have a little bit of sympathy for me. Really? Yes, and, and, and the weirdest thing of all happened at the very end. What? He offered me to audition with the prison choir. What? Are you kidding? I thought that was just for girls with great records. Yes, I know. I had the same reaction. Wow, he must have really liked you. I know. Weird, right? I, 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 went, I went from thinking that I was going to be in trouble to be offered an audition for the choir. When's the audition? Tomorrow. When's the audition? Tomorrow. Do you know what you're going to sing? Well, I thought I'd sing Throw Out the Lifeline. Do you know it? No, but I like the title. Seems appropriate for this place. The lights fade. The scene changes to the prison yard. Ella, Alice, Althea, and Dorothy are playing a game of basketball when a commotion breaks out on the other side of the yard. It's two girls, one white, one black, who are trying to wrestle each other down to the ground pulling hair, and slapping each other. Oh, shit. What's going on over there? A fight? Well, I can see that it's a fight. What is it between a black girl and a white girl? Yeah. Are you kidding me? That black girl must be crazy to start a fight with a white girl here. Oh, ouch. <laughs> and it looks like she's winning, too. My lord. Mm. Oh, shit. Here comes a guard. Who is that? Paul Eddie? Yep. Hey, girl, you might want to stop now before Paul Eddie gets to you. He's a mean motherfucker. Mm. The guard comes charging in, takes the black girl by the nap of her hair, her, her shirt, and flings her to the side. As she lays on the ground, he starts beating her viciously with his nightstick. Ow. Ugh. Ow. She's down already. Get him to stop it. He ain't stopping. Ow. Ooh. What about the white girl? She was fighting just as dirty. What the fuck? I can't watch this. Where, where are the other guards? She's going to get killed. He's hitting her on the head, hitting her on the arms, hitting her even after she's knocked out. Truly crazy and excessive. As it continues, the girls start yelling. Stop! Stop! It. Stop! stop. Somebody stop. stop! Stop it! Ella looks up at the watchtower, and the guard in the tower is watching the scene with pleasure. It becomes clear to the audience that Eddie can beat the girl to death, and no one will care. Finally, when he's decided he's had enough, he saddles his nightstick puts his hands on his hips, and raises his head up to the girl in the yard. An arrogant smirk on his face, and he walks away, leaving the girl's body unattended on the ground. End of scene. Next day, prison mess hall, it's daytime. Ella, Alice, Althea, and Dorothy sit facing each other. They're talking quietly, when Althea's attention is distracted by Paul Eddy walking into the mess hall. Ella notices Althea looking scornfully at Eddie's direction. Althea, what are you looking at? I'm looking at that psycho, Paul Eddy. What, are you crazy? Does he 
doesn't he have any comprehension of what kind of low life he is? So staring at him is going to make him change his behavior? Stop looking at him. But what about, look. But, oh, you know buts. You, you keep your head down now. What do you want, your back? You want to get your head bashed in too? No, but I don't understand. No, I'm you telling you right now, or you'll have me not defending you ever again. There are places to choose your battles and this is not one of them. But I don't- No but, shut up and eat. Just because one man's crazy doesn't mean you have to act crazy too. She's right, Althea. She is right, Althea. Oh, okay. Althea puts her head down and starts eating her food. The scene changes to the prison chapel. It's audition day for the prison choir. The prison choir is led by an extremely dynamic man named Mr. Ellison. As Ella walks in, the choir is performing a near flawless version of Amazing Grace. Was blind, but now I see. That was very good, girls. Only a few comments. Tanya, you were a wee bit flat. Sarah, you're singing louder than everybody. Tone it down a bit. And Darlene, why are you in such a rush? You're singing faster than everyone else. I'm still just a bit nervous, sir. <laughs> OK, listen, Darlene. Amazing grace. Now that's our tempo. It's relaxed, like the heartbeat of Jesus as he walks along his path. Now on our journey, we are walking with Jesus, not galloping along ahead of him. Darlene, can you join us and walk with Jesus? Can you join us? Yes, Darlene, sir. Darlene, can you join us? Yes, sir. Thank you, Jesus. And thank you, Darlene. And don't, yes, sir. Don't be nervous, Darlene. We have a lot of time to put all of this out before our next performance. Hi there. You must be Ella. Mr. Ellison looks up from his notes and note. Ella? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, Ella Fitzgerald. Ella? Yes, sir. Okay, uh, Ella Fitzgerald. It says on my notes that you have some experience. You have some experience singing in choirs. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Uh, 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 both in school and in, in church. Okay. Now, have you brought along a song with which to audition? Yes, it's an old Negro spiritual called "Throw Out the Lifeline." Are you familiar with it? Uh, yes, I certainly am. Go ahead, Ella. Throw out the lifeline across the dark way. There is a brother who someone should save. Somebody's brother. Oh, who then will dare to throw out the lifeline his peril to share? Throw out the lifeline, throw out the lifeline. Someone is drifting away. Throw When it is over, the entire choir, Mr. Ellison included, stands in stunned admiration. Mr. Ellison takes a moment to figure out what he wants to say. Praise the Lord, my, oh my. 
Ella, you're in. Please take your place among the girls. Back to Ella and Alice at the prison cell. So how'd it go today? It, it went really well. I'm in. You're in, just like that. I'm in. <laughs> yeah, just like that. Although just, I had to audition. Just like that. Yes, so just like that? that. I had to audition, though. It went really well, I think. Oh, that's so great. It went really well, I think. Alice gets up to hug Ella. Suddenly, a sound interrupts their conversation. It is the sound of a billy club sliding against iron bars. It's one of the guards on his rounds. We need to be quiet. They go back to their bunks. The guard O'Boyle appears outside their cell. His face is bathed in a red and smoky light. He peers in. Both Ella and Alice hold their breath and pretend to sleep. They can hear O'Boyle's heavy breathing. He finally loses interest and walks away. Jesus, I know what you mean. How could the superintendent be nice and yet not know about crazy guards like him? I just had the same thought. Did you smell his breath? He stank like alcohol. What do they do, drink before they work? Uh, well, maybe they drink doing their work. Not much else to do. Their conversation is interrupted by some sounds down the hall. It's O'Boyle as he stops by another cell. We can hear a muffled conversation, and then we hear the sound of the cell door down the hall being unlocked. Then a girl's terrifying voice pleading. Please leave me alone. Please don't do anything. I ain't done nothing. Alice and Ella look at each other petrified. Oh, shit. They hear the sound of a scuffle in the distant cell. Then the sound of a girl saying, please, no. Then again, please, no. Then they hear a muffled scream. Ella and Alice look at each other, both understanding exactly what is happening. End of scene. Stage left, the prison mess hall daytime. Several girls are seating at a, a long prison mess hall table. It's the same group of girls who were seated in the earlier scene, except now, one of the girls, Lakeisha Morris, is missing. Y'all hear what happened last night? I ain't speculating. It ain't smart to speculate here. Does anyone know who it happened to? I hear it was Lakeisha Morris. Oh man, he sure sounded bad. She shouldn't be here at the, shouldn't she be here at the table? Yeah, that's right, isn't it? it? It didn't have nothing to do with what happened between you and her the other day, did it? Excuse me? Well, you get into a fight with her and now she disappears. It, I, it had nothing to do with me. Superintendent Morris enters the room and bangs on the gavel. Good morning, ladies. An interesting opportunity came up this morning for those of you with spotless records. Our new doctor, Dr. Grant, needs some work done to his house, mostly just cleanup. And he thought that he would offer this work to you girls here at the institution. He's even offered to pay you girls 20 cents an hour <laughs> for those of you who are eligible. It's an interesting opportunity for those of you that are eligible to go off campus. It entails a supervised walk to and from his house through town. Uh, please come to the sign-up table once the bell rings. Thank you. Mm -mm. Damn, that ain't weird. 
No mention of Lakeisha at all. Not one word. That is weird. Either she didn't know about her or she's pretending she doesn't know. Exactly. Mm -hmm. That is strange, to be honest. Right? I know. Either she doesn't know or she is a really good actress. Honestly, it looks to me like she just doesn't know. I get that same feeling. It's still weird. Yes. And then the question becomes... Whether she chooses not to know or simply isn't informed. Yes. How would you feel about doing this job she talked about? I would love to get off campus. You've got a spotless record here, right? You've been here almost a year. Yeah. Want to sign up? The worst thing they can do is say no. Sure. End of scene. The next scene, walking up Warren Street in Hudson to Dr. Grant's house. Six girls walk up Hudson's main drag, holding ropes to each other like a chain gang. They are led by a male guard with a baton. They pass various citizens who look at the girls with outright disrespect. I didn't realize it would be this uncomfortable to leave ground. They're looking at us as if we've got the play. Don't pay any attention to it. Rise above. I know I need to rise above, but it still makes me feel uncomfortable. At this point, the group of girls see a man approaching them, the likes of which they have never seen before. He is a natalie attired black man dressed in a three-piece suit, wearing glasses and an elegant hat and shoes. He quickly crosses the street towards them, carrying a sign that says, protesting the conditions at Hudson's New York Training School for Girls. He addresses the girls, asking them how are they doing. The girls know that talking to the man would get them into trouble, so they don't respond. He then explains to him that, that he is Dr. Ross, a doctor from Harlem, a founding member of the NAACP. And he tells them that he's come to protest the conditions at Hudson's New York Training School for girls. And again, the girls try to ignore him. The prison guard goes up to the doctor and says something to him, and the audience can't hear. Dr. Ross knows that they don't want him to talk to them, and the guard sticks his baton into the doctor's chest. The doctor leaves, telling the girls that they are not forgotten. The guard drags the girls forward with the ropes. Oh, did I just see that? Well, I, I think we both did. We should, we should shut our mouths. The girls enter a gate just outside of town and come upon a huge Victorian mansion gorgeous but in complete disrepair okay girls you can let go of the rope now 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 just be good girls and none of you think about running off and we'll be okay yes sir yes okay. sir. right well we're gonna go room by room start with this one and you're gonna take all the junk you pick up and throw it into the wagon that's parked outside the window yes sir yes sir okay the work begins. Ella drags a large piece of floorboard to the window. She sees a little blonde girl peering in at her from the yard outside. The little girl looks up at Ella, smiles, and holds eye contact. Ella has never been smiled at by a white girl before. Ella struggles for a second without of how to respond, and then she smiles back. Who is that little girl? 
Oh, uh, well, this is Dr. Grant's house. I'm guessing that is his little girl. Well, hmm. And she's cute. <laughs> it's like she's looking right into your soul. Yeah, and I, I know, right? Very strange. <laughs> Girls, time to finish up. The lights dim. End of scene. Stage left. Back to the prison cell. The scene starts in complete darkness. The audience can hear some clanking, the sound of a billy club hitting iron bars, and keys opening up another prison cell. Yet another girl is being attacked. You awake? Yes. I'm scared. Can you please talk for a minute? Yeah, sure. Are you scared too? Oh, yes, of course. Why is it that you never seem scared? I guess the answer is I can't let fear take over. If I hadn't let that happen, I would have been done years ago. And when you're done, well, that means you're done. And I can't afford to let that happen to me. But what if you have no cause for hope? Then I guess you have to create one. Giving up is always the easiest choice. Got a problem you can't handle? Best choice is just to give up. But then you give up and then what? It's sort of boring, right? Lazy to me or just lacking imagination. What distinguishes us from other animals is our consciousness, our ability to dream. So even when things may seem helpless, we can still count on our imagination to save us from unimaginable circumstances to envision our way out of our predicament. I don't think my imagination is that powerful, unfortunately. I wouldn't be so sure. I know you now. You're as tough as you said you were. Even if you yourself don't know it. You know anything about scripture, Alice? A little. Well, Jesus said, I am the light of this world. I think about that phrase a lot. I think it's a metaphor. I am the light. You can be the light too. God gives us each our own divine light. It's our job to nurture our own, to recognize our own light and nurture the light in others. I guess that's what faith means to me. It's not some white bearded guy in the sky. It's learning to recognize the divine light in others. Then life can be joyful, even in dark times. What about people like O'Boyle? I'm not naive, Alice. Evil exists too. If there's divine light, then there's dark, the darkness of evil too. It's part of the balance of nature. But evil, but evil is mostly based on ignorance. It's blind and ignorant and lashing out in the darkness against things that it's afraid of and doesn't understand. It's our responsibility as light-filled beings to fight back against the forces of darkness, either through love or through fighting itself. Sometimes, in fact, we are forced to fight. I'm not just, a, I'm just not a big believer in giving up. In fact, I think it's the easy way out. You don't just give up on your own divine light because I can see it there so clearly. Ella holds out her hand for Alice to take. Alice grabs it. Have faith, dear, that we'll get through this alive because we will. Okay. I think there will be a bright, shiny future ahead of us. End of the scene. Prison mess hall, daytime. Ella, Alice, Althea, and Dorothy sit facing each other at breakfast. It is the morning after yet another attack on a girl. Y'all hear her? Did y'all hear last night? Another girl attacked? Yes. Do either of you know who it was? It's like nothing happened. Where's the upset? Where's the consternation? Nothing. Are we all just getting used to this? Another girl missing from bre the breakfast table? This time we don't even know who it is. Settle down, Althea. Settle down? Why should I settle down? Our lives here don't mean shit. At least they made it very clear, right? Our lives don't mean a thing. At least I have that clarity now. I just don't want to see you becoming an object of attention, Althea. No, I know, Ella. And I know you have the best of intentions. 
I just don't want any of us to become resigned to this shit. It's inhumane. Where's the superintendent today? Didn't have the energy to come up in front of us and pretend like nothing had happened? What the fuck is she all about? <sighs> Althea, you've got to tone it down. A guard in the back of the room has become aware of Althea's loud complaining and starts walking towards their table, tapping his baton on his hand. He looks down at Althea. You, come with me. Me? That's right. Get off your ass and come with me. Uh, please, sir. She's just not feeling good this morning. She wasn't doing anything bad. Take her. Yeah, was I talking to you? Or do you want to come with me, too? Get up now. Come with me. The lights fade out with Althea getting up, being grabbed by the arm by the guard and escorted away from the table. End of scene. The next scene, the choir concert. Good afternoon, my friends. We are very proud to welcome you all to the second annual concert at the New York Training School for Girls. Many of you are old friends and acquaintances of ours. Some of you, like Mayor Boyle and Superintendent Morse, are honored guests. And some of you are new friends. Welcome all. We have started presenting these concerts as a way of reaching out to the community and showing you, our people, that there is more to this place than mere punishment. That through our programs, we hope not only to rehabilitate our girls, but hopefully lead them into future professions. We're going to start this concert with a Negro spiritual sung by our very own Ella Fitzgerald. The song is called, This Morning When I Rose. Please give a hand for our girl. This morning when I rose, yeah, I didn't have no doubt. This morning when I rose, yeah, I didn't have no doubt. This morning when I rose, yeah, I didn't have no doubt. I know the Lord will take care of me. He will provide for me. He'll lead me, guide me all the way. This morning when I rose, yeah, I didn't have no doubt. Well, this morning when I got up out of bed, y'all, I didn't have no doubt. This morning when I rose, yeah, I didn't have no doubt. I know the Lord will take care of me. He will provide for me. He'll lead me, guide me all the way. In the audience of the performance, we have the prison doctor, Dr. Grant, his little daughter, Alma, and the man the girl encountered on the street, Dr. Ross. When the song ends, the crowd is on its feet. There is no doubt that something magical about this young woman. And when the concert is over, there is a line to meet Ella. Ella shakes the hand of several people before the doctor and his daughter come to the head of the line. Ella, uh, I'm Dr. Grant, the doctor for the training school. Very nice to meet you. That, that was a wonderful performance. Well, uh, thank you very much, sir. My daughter seems to have a bit of a talent scout in her. She apparently scoped you out weeks ago when you're doing some work around our house. She barely talked about anything since, and now I know why. Why? Why, thank you. Now, you've met my daughter already, but do you know her name? The she girl, is Alma. The girl who is about six or seven gives Ella a charming curtsy. Ella, not knowing exactly what to do, curtsies back. Very and beyond your dazzling you. talent, you two seem to have something of a mysterious, inexplicable connection. So we'll have to do something about getting the two of you more often together. That would be great. At this moment, the superintendent rushes in and whispers to Dr. Grant. Suddenly, the brilliant smile on the doctor's face is transformed into alarm. 
I, I'm, I'm very sorry. There's been a bit of an emergency. Got to run. Congratulations again. It's nighttime. The prison gangway. The girls are leaving the performance hall, cutting across a yard to the main building. They are extremely happy, and they are still singing as they walk. One by one, each of the girls heads towards their own cell, finally leaving Ella as the last girl, still singing as she enters her cell. The only problem, there is no sign of Alice. She's gone. Alice? She goes from side to side of the cell to check if Alice isn't there. Alice! She lifts the wrinkled sheet off of Alice's bed. Alice! She crawls around the floor of the cell and discovers what could be a shirt under her bed. Alice! A boy got her. What? A boy got her, and he got her good. Where is she? At this point, well, where is she? At this point, a different guard appears at the door to her cell, and Ella is ready to fight. Ready to fight? Bring it on. She gets into a fighting crouch with her fist out. It's quite impressive. I am actually not here for that, Ella. You're going to have to trust me. I'm here to take you to Dr. Grant's office. Really? Really, but we're in a rush. Please come with me. In the next scene is the living room of Dr. Grant's house. The guard brings Ella up to Dr. Grant's house and knocks on the front door. Dr. Grant opens it up. Behind him stands his daughter, Alma, a female nurse and Dr. Ross. Hello, Ella. Where's Alice? She's here in my office. Is she okay? Well, she's gonna have a bit of a headache tomorrow morning, but she's going to be quite all right. She's going to survive. Oh my God, I was so scared. Well, you, you had a right to be. Can I see her? In a bit. I, is that all right, Ella? We'd like to let her sleep a bit. You understand, don't you? Uh, this part of the healing process. Yes, sir. Can I ask you, was she? No, 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 she wasn't. She apparently put up quite a good fight. I'm treating O'Boyle in another room. Uh, don't worry, he can't get to her. And even if he could, I'm not sure he'd want to. For a little girl, she packs quite a wallop. Oh, thank God. She may be little, but she sure is tough. Ella, I have to talk to you very seriously for a moment. Is that okay? Yes. I, I want to tell you, I'm, I'm mortified, Ella. Mortified. If I had any inkling of what was going on here, I would have never taken a position here. I thought the New York Training School for Girls was literally that, a school, not a torture chamber. I want to introduce you to Dr. Ross here, who alerted me to what's going on, and he's been trying to alert the public to this as well. Uh, hello, Ella. I'm very pleased to meet you. I'm very pleased to meet you as well, Dr. Ross. Ella, we don't know yet if this is system-wide or who is responsible. All I know that as a physician, it is my duty to care for you and protect you. Dr. Ross and I have agreed that if you were to return to your cell, you might be subjected to retaliation. We simply can't let that happen. So, time is of the essence. We have decided to make other plans to protect you, if you would agree. Now, Dr. Ross here has come up with a brilliant idea. Dr. Ross. Yes, thank you. Ella, firstly, I am terribly sorry for what happened to your friend and what has been going on in that that prison. As you may recall, my wife and I were just in attendance at your performance with the chorus and your talent is extraordinary. It just so happens that the amateur night at the Apollo Theater is coming up in a few weeks and we think you should be there. We're willing and able to put you up at our house in Harlem for however as long as you need to stay with us. Might you be interested in trying this out? 
Yes. <laughs> Wonderful. It's all going to have to be done very quietly though. Technically, we are helping you escape. So basically, we are going to have to sneak you out and Alice as well out of here. Is this acceptable to you? Yes. Good, good. Are there any physical possessions you or Alice might need before we get out of here? If so, we would have to go back to the cell, which for obvious reasons we would prefer not to do. My wife and I can buy you some new clothes when we all get back to the city. I don't need anything. I'm, I'm pretty sure Alice doesn't need anything from the cell either. Thank you for offering though. All right, let's all get going. There's a lot we need to do very quickly. End of scene. The final scene. It's amateur night at the Apollo Theater. The scene opens with Ella and Alice on the far left side of the stage as the festivities begin at the first ever amateur night at the Apollo Theater in Harlem. They stand observing Ralph Cooper, the founder, originator, and producer of Amateur Night. Oh my God, Ella, can you believe it? We're actually here? <laughs> it's amazing, pinch me. I would never have believed that anything like this would ever be possible. You just never stopped believing. You're such an inspiration to me. Welcome to the first ever amateur night at the Apollo Theater. My name is Ron Cooper. This is a new kind of amateur night. You can call it amateur night unchained. Like a performance? Let the audience know. Hate it? Don't be shy. Let your feelings be known. This is not for the shrinking violets. It's the Bible of the fittest on stage. Now, a few of our guests might require a bit more gentleness than others, particularly when they're kids. So bear that in mind, please. Our next guest is 15-year-old Ella Fitzgerald, hailing all the way from Virginia. Please welcome Ella Fitzgerald. Hi, Ella. How are you doing today? Uh, all right. Nervous. Is this your first public performance? Oh, in front of this many people? Yes. <laughs> well, I'm sure you're going to do fine. What song would you like to perform for us tonight, dear? Um, it's a song I wrote with my mother called A Tisket, A Tasket. Orchestra? You good with that one? Take it away! <laughs> A tisket, a tasket, a brown and yellow basket. I sent a letter to my mommy on the way I dropped it. I dropped it, I dropped it. Yes, on the way I dropped it. A little girly picked it up and put it in her pocket. She was a trucking on down the avenue. Not a single thing to do. She went peck, peck, pecking all around. When she spied it on the ground, she took it, she took it, my little yellow basket. And if she doesn't bring it back, I think that I will die. A tisket, a tasket, I lost my yellow basket. And if that girlie don't return it, don't know what I'll do. Oh dear, I wonder where that basket can be. Oh gee, I wish that little girl I could see. Oh, why was I so careless with that basket of mine? That itty bitty basket was a joy of mine. A 
tisket, a tasket. I lost my yellow basket. Won't someone help me find my basket and make me happy again? again? Was it green? No, 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 no. Was it red? No, 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 no. Was it blue? No, 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 no. Just a little yellow basket. A little yellow basket. Hello. Brava, you have been watching Ella the Ungovernable, a new play by David McDonald. I'm Melania Levitsky. I'm the director. I'm in New York City at the moment. And I want to thank Crystal Field and everyone at Theater for the New City. We are very, very honored to be a part of your season. And now I would like the cast to introduce themselves, please. Hi, my name is Alexis Ward. I played Ella Fitzgerald and I live in Chicago, Illinois. Oh, I I'm Kylie Anderson. Uh, I'm in Chicago and I played Alice. Hey guys, I'm Jasmine Jones and I played Althea and I am currently in Chicago, Illinois as well. Hi, I'm Shalisa Hollis Landis. I played Dorothy and girl number two and I'm in Houston, Texas. Hi everyone, I'm Ann Perry Wallace and I played Tempe and I am in Memphis, Tennessee. Hi, I'm Eddie Allen. I'm uh... I played Joseph and Dr. Grant, and I'm living in New York. Hi, I'm Kim Howard. I played the lady on the bus, the girl on the street, the bully in the prison, and on Edna um, and girl number one, and I am in Brooklyn, New York. Hi, I'm Celia Schaefer. I played the superintendent and the social worker, and I am based in Greenwich Village, New York. <laughs> Hi, I'm George Pappas, and I played the landlord and Dr. Moreno, and I'm here in New York City. Hello, my name is Larry Gregory. I am uh, in the East Village in New York City, and I was Mr. Ellison. Hi, hi, hi how you doing? I'm Jibba Malay Anderson. I played the role of Dr. Emmy Ross, and I live in Chicago, Illinois. Hi, my name is Philip Grant, and I was the narrator and MC Ralph Cooper, and I'm from Nassau, New York. Hi, I'm David McDonald. I'm the playwright. I'm in Philmont, New York. Hi, I'm Crystal Field. I'm the executive director of Theater for the New City, and right now, I am in Germantown, New York, and Theater for the New City has a real connection with this area, Columbia County, Hudson, and Germantown, and Philmont. And we've been with artists from this area, David Foreman and Romulus Lilly, and we are so pleased and proud to have a new play by David McDonald. We also want to uh, urge you to come and attend next week, Thursday night after the clapping. We will present a new play by Ava Dorapal. And so we fully intend to produce this play, this really relevant and wonderful play in the fall. So if anyone out there has funds they want to help us with, we will gratefully accept them. And so from this wonderful cast and director, and especially the writer, we say to you, au revoir, mais non adieu, which means goodbye, but not farewell, till we meet again. Ciao.